Connecticut Valley Views recently had the great pleasure to visit the University of Connecticut campus in stores to speak with its new president, Susan Herbst. This is an opportunity for our viewers to have a closer look at this venerable institution and take pride that UConn is the number one public university in New England and among the top 27 in the nation. We're very happy to be here. Connecticut Valley Views welcomes the opportunity to speak with you for a few moments today. I know Thanks so busy much. Schedule. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, as a former executive and vice chancellor and chief academic officer for the University System of Georgia, what, what attracted you to the position here as the first woman, actually, for UConn since its establishment in 1881? the envy of a lot of research universities because of the UConn 2000 project mm -hmm. which really changed the face of the campus and just the, you know the investment year after year that that our legislature and and our governors have made they're the very campus. dedicated towards making this a top college they are they are and uh, I think people understand that you know as the research university for Connecticut that's our mission is that uh, we really we need investment in order to not only create jobs um, but also to create new knowledge, and that's what we're all about, whether it's in the fine arts or, you know, philosophy, English, or stem cells and, and finding the cure for cancer. I mean, those are things that we sure. really are about, and uh, so I think we, we bring a tremendous amount by way of culture, science, and understanding of the world to Connecticut. Was there a reaction? I guess this might be more in a personal feeling. It, was there a reaction to you being the first woman president? Did you get a sense? And I'm not saying that this would necessarily be an adverse reaction, mm -hmm. but was it surprise or interest or congratulations? How do you feel, the, generally speaking, the faculty reacted? Uh, well, I don't know about the, the and faculty. Students, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the only, um, I, I think most people, uh, professionals out in the world, you know, have seen that you know, women are now, you know, CEOs or college presidents. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, among among that, that group of people, I don't think there was so much surprise, but there should be because only 14% of research university presidents are women. So I think people get a sense because there are some high profile women presidents that there are a lot of us and there rarely aren't. Um, and uh, the same holds true, a very small percentage of women are community college presidents mm -hmm. and comprehensive university presidents. So we have a ways to go. And certainly, I don't know if they've ever looked at the data on uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, mm -hmm. a very tiny percentage, single digits are women. So um, they weren't surprised they should be, mm -hmm. <laughs> given those numbers, which are grim. Um, but I will say the best reaction is from students. And I just had a student in my office today saying, you know, how incredibly proud she and the other women students are at UConn to have a women, woman president. So to me, what the students think yeah. is, is probably the most important. And yeah, I think, I think what's important is there's a role model to follow. Right, right. It's not so much, oh gosh, we won, right. our side won. I think it's more now we have someone to follow. So yeah. if you show your accomplishments, you prove that you can do it, you prove that you perhaps can do it, you're the best man for the job as That's a woman, right. <laughs> uh, that perhaps uh, that makes a way for them. It yeah. Makes it easier. No, I, yeah, absolutely. And the more women that we can get, you know, in the top executive mm -hmm. positions of organizations, the better it is for the, for the next generation of women coming out who, um, who need that kind of support and that kind of um, symbolism. Mm -hmm. Um, your top three objectives, would you say that fundraising is one of them, and if so, where would those dollars go? Sure, uh, fundraising is absolutely a top priority, and that would be true for any university president you meet who would, who would come on your show. Mm. Um, it's a time, especially for public institutions, uh, where our state appropriations are down, and uh, we need to make up for that. But even if they weren't down, even if they were, um, they were flat or growing, uh, we really need to protect the university into the long term. Because there will be uh, other economic ups and downs. Of course. And the only way to protect a university for that is to have a decent sized endowment so that these, um, these problems in the economy don't affect the quality of our product, which is education. And, uh, you know, I'll say, I mean, a lot of people don't quite understand that the university is forever. And that's why our budgeting tends to be pretty conservative, is because we're supposed to serve the state of Connecticut, you know, through eternity. Well, you that's know, the ROI. That's right. And uh, the, the, you know, companies come and go. If things aren't going well, they shut down or try something different. And we don't have that option. We mm -hmm. have to be a big, comprehensive research university forever. Um, and so that's why universities have endowments. 
uh, is, is for that kind of long-term protection. Well, it's really keeping a rainy day fund. And so exactly. You need, to, you need to make the, the hay you know, while the sun shines mm -hmm. so that when these days come, you don't have to worry or be concerned about it because it actually takes you unfocused from your day-to-day -day activities when you're worried about writing the check. Yeah, and uh, you know we're not fragile by any means, but we'd be in much better condition if we had the kind of endowment that's appropriate for a university our size. Mm -hmm. Well, given your long tenure, in education. What criteria, and this kind of goes back to the question in your discussion about women and setting a role model and so forth, what personal attributes, and I guess I might say what personal attributes for a woman do you think contribute towards a successful leader? Uh, in higher education, which is the only field mm -hmm. I know, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, is uh, you have to be very collaborative. Um, you have to work in groups, work in teams. I mean, it's a bit, it's a joke often that we at the university always have a committee whenever an issue sure. comes up, and it's true. Mm -hmm. And it's because we're a culture of discussion, we're a culture of argument. I mean, academics are all about critique and new knowledge. And so whether it's about their science or their art or how to make the university a better place, we want to talk about it in groups. So it's one of the reasons I like to, to be a leader in academe is because I like that culture of discussion, argument. I do think that as many you, the more opinions you get from people who are stakeholders, mm -hmm. who really care, um, the better you're going to do in making new policy and, and forging the future and a strategic plan for the university. So uh, being collaborative is, is absolutely number one. Um, that said, this is like a big corporation. It is a big corporation. Of course it is. And um, it's, a, it's an enterprise that needs you know, very close attention. Uh, we need to have you know the right people in the right places mm -hmm. with the right kinds of portfolios, mm -hmm. and you know it is my job to make sure that people are accountable to me and to the state of Connecticut because we do we serve um, the citizens of the state, the governor, and the legislature, and we have to make sure things go right. Mm -hmm. Well, I I I think also in speaking to that, what's important is is that you're saying you want to hear, so you're going to listen, mm -hmm. then you're going to sort, and what I think that what makes the good leader is that they have heard all the discussions and ultimately you make a decision after hearing that. I think that's key because otherwise you get so many diverse voices mm -hmm. and it, you end up making a mess rather than actually a good stew. And uh, you know, I think that uh, one of the challenges becoming a university president, and I think I imagine it's true of becoming the head of any big complex organization, is that um, you need to listen to everybody. Mm -hmm. At the same time, decisions are coming flying at you every day. Uh, so I'm trying to work my way through the entire university, through every academic department, and um, listen to people, hear about what their departments are doing, whether they're the English department mm. or payroll or mm. financial aid or philosophy. Mm. Uh, and so uh, just due to scheduling, you know, I, I can, it takes a while to do that. Of course. But at the same time, you know, I have to work in real time, too, and make a lot of decisions. So uh, it's, you know, the, the first year is just it's got to be like that, and mm. I'll do the best I can. Prioritization. It is. Right it is. Well, you spoke at a recent Metro Hartford Alliance uh, breakfast meeting in which Catherine Smith, uh, who is the commissioner of the Department of Economic and Community Development, she was also a speaker. You had a very interesting conversation. And to that end, to the current and future plans for the university to assure that the courses offered here on campus meet the job industry opportunities and retain some of this youthful workforce in Connecticut, your thoughts on the best way to do that? Well, you know, I think one of the things we need to do is more, work more closely, UConn, with uh, the other Connecticut State Universities. Um, they obviously serve the workforce of Connecticut in a very direct and different way than we do. Um, it takes a student less time to graduate from a lot of those institutions, especially the community colleges. Um, but I think that while transfer um, between the institutions is seamless, I'm not sure that we're always thinking about job and career paths. Mm -hmm. You know, if a student um, is excelling at one of those institutions and needs to improve their skills further to get into the workforce, you know, how does mm -hmm. UConn then enhance what they do? Uh, many of our students go, obviously, go right into the workforce. Um, students who are in fields like accounting and finance and, and the health professions, they are still getting jobs and pretty quickly out of school. Um, the large majority of students uh, are having a lot of difficulty right now. And it is, um, it does, it keeps me up at night and it is painful to see students who are doing everything we told them to do. And you know, talented, studying hard, capable. they're talented, they're capable, and they just cannot get a position in their field. So, you know, a lot of our students are very... Do you encourage them then? Do they, you encourage them to maybe deviate? And yeah, I mean, we do. Yeah. We, we, uh, we are often encouraging them toward internships, mm -hmm. to trying to work in their field somehow. 
while they work for another job that pays the bills that's Which not they in their might field. find out actually is quite appealing because they never thought about it never had the yeah i mean they you know they're young people mm -hmm. and they're very positive Adaptable, yeah. and uh, i mean that's the great thing about working at a university in these dark times mm -hmm. uh, dark economic times for america is uh, universities are a very positive mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. you know we have thirty thousand young people here mm -hmm. um, all who think that the world is their oyster mm -hmm. and it's a kind of positive energy that that lifts up all the adults mm -hmm. well it's a kind of an innocent in a way it is and we won't it call is. it it's beautiful but it's uh, yes it is it's, it's very, beautiful very and uh, they uh, another thing our students I have to say our students are so imaginative um, even though they uh, are not always as worried about you know mm. economic future because they're mm. young and they don't have families mm. to support mm. um, is a lot of them are trying to figure out how to start their own businesses so that when they graduate, they'll have a business to go to. Entrepreneurial, have a well, yeah. which is very necessary in today's world. So a lot of um, web companies, mm -hmm. students starting up very interesting ideas, uh, retail and, and services, and it's impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are often starting these um, web businesses when they're sophomores or juniors, mm -hmm. you know, just try to gear up um, for when they don't have the position. A lot of them are thinking of going to graduate school sooner than mm -hmm. they might normally. Um, and then we have so many students who want to go into AmeriCorps, the Peace Corps, Teach for America. They which want are, to improve the world, don't they? They, yeah. see, they see that it seems to be falling apart. They want to do something for They it. do. I mean, they really, they care. The students these days um, are not uh, self-absorbed, contrary to mm -hmm. popular opinion. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, generations. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think the students of today are so accustomed to doing public service mm -hmm. because the high schools are doing a much better job at that. True. So by the time we get a freshman at UConn, um, they will understand the value of giving back to their mm -hmm. community because that's what they're asked mm -hmm. to do in high school. So it's wonderful for us because then they get here and they get to um, get to, to really explore that and uh, do it in more intense ways. So it's one of the nicest changes I've seen in my in my 20 plus years in higher education. They may be the next great generation. They may be. They may be. Well, in, in that same vein, um, you've indicated in prior media comments that you've made that you believe uh, to enhance the culture of accessibility for yourself for the faculty to have a kind of an open door office hours. Have you found that the students have taken advantage of that? Do you see that happening? Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, just this morning, um, I had my monthly, it's about about to every month, uh, office hours. And uh, yeah, students were lined up. You know, we, we were booked the whole time. Mm -hmm. And they come in with everything from, you know, I can't get the courses I need when I need them, very, very serious, mm -hmm. um, to, uh, uh, you know, just ideas they have about campus mm -hmm. beautification, about athletics, about um, professors and, and what they should or shouldn't do. And uh, it's just, you know, runs the gamut. Um, and today I even had uh, Jonathan the Husky visit me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> is that right? Really? Yeah, there's a few students who, who kind of sure. are his handlers. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, um, and they had a few issues about Jonathan and yes, how he's yes. used during the games. Yes. And, um, so that's a lot of fun. But, but yeah, this is a place, this place is for students. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why mm -hmm. it was established. And, uh, and it's a real pleasure to see them and, and hear from them. Oh. Well, you're a person of great energy, that's quite evident, and despite your many responsibilities, you've written a book. Uh, it's Rude Democracy, Civility, and Incivility in American Politics, and you've taught classes in your mm -hmm. previous career background. Uh, will you teach at UConn? Yeah, I will eventually. It's just a, it's a matter of when, and mm -hmm. uh, I really do like to teach during a presidential election season, so that would mean this fall. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure okay. out how to manage that. But uh, and it's it's very for a political scientist, it's mm -hmm. wonderful to teach mm -hmm. during an election year because um, the class runs itself, mm -hmm. you know, and there's mm -hmm. so much material to work with. But I do think that um, administrators, leaders, yes. often get. Uh, disassociated with students mm -hmm. and faculty mm -hmm. and they start to forget what it's like um, to teach mm -hmm. and uh, how much energy that takes how much effort it takes how hard it is yes um, and teaching the last few years after not teaching for several years mm -hmm. um, reminded me just how much support young people need and how even the most talented young person can really fall off track if they don't have attention from adults who care and that can be a professor, that can be a department secretary, mm -hmm. um, that can be a, you know a dorm leader, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's a it's a reminder to me that you know administrators can get untethered from the true life of the university mm -hmm. unless they teach. Um, if you don't teach and you're an administrator and you just see students at award ceremonies and that sort right, of thing, too far removed. You are. You and are. They know it. And they know it, and they sense that you don't understand their world mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'll absolutely get back to it um, as soon as I, I, I figure yeah. out, you know, exactly what's going on here in, right. in stores.
Well, it's been very interesting visiting with you today. Again, appreciate very much your time that you gave to us, given your busy schedule. We do appreciate it. Can I Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right. Thank you.